Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the iHeart Pluto Science Speaker Series. Tonight, we have the fourth installment in the Worlds Revealed series, where we're exploring our solar system in different ways, as interpreted by our talented group of speakers. So we thank you for joining us um, as we celebrate the 92nd anniversary of the discovery of Pluto. I'd like to mention that tonight's talk sponsor is the Historic Brewing Company in Flagstaff, Arizona. Please check out our website, iheartpluto.org, for our upcoming events in this um, festival. My name is Amanda Bosch. I'm a planetary scientist at Lowell Observatory, and I'm also the chief operating officer. During my career, I've studied Pluto's atmosphere, the rings of Saturn, and many other topics. I've also been an avid astro imager, and so I am very pleased to introduce you to a very accomplished astro imager, Tom Palakis, tonight. So Tom has been an active amateur astronomer for 45 years, during which he has seen um, Saturn circle the sun one and a half times. His main interests involve visual observing of all astronomical phenomena and imaging of the same with equipment ranging from a phone to a backyard observatory. He has a particular interest in describing the universe as an ever-changing entity. His writing and photography have regularly appeared in magazines such as Astronomy and Sky and Telescope. And more recently, he's been an author or co-author in several refereed astronomical publications. So I wanted to let you know that tonight we're gonna to save the questions until the end, but please feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat box and we'll get to them when we, um, after we finished the um, main presentation. So we'll, with that, um, I'm, Tom will talk with us about astronomical time-lapse imaging. So please take it away. All right, thank you very much, Amanda. It's really an honor to be doing a presentation uh, at this festival. And um, I'm gonna jump right into it and share the screen here. That one. And the title of the talk has to do with, uh, it's time-lapse imaging. And the second to the century reference means that some of these changes that I'll be showing just take you know, seconds to occur. When you get deeper out into space, the distances are so large that you need decades or even centuries to see the type of changes, that changes that are happening. But everything in the sky, even though we kind of get a static picture when we look at it, is evolving, changing. And the cool thing about time-lapse imaging is we get to speed that up. And so this is just an example of the three different cameras that got used and the type of images that we'll be looking at. So I originally got into time-lapse uh, imaging, got interested in it in 1979 as a teenager. And I saw this beautiful uh, time-lapse of Voyager 1 approaching Jupiter. And so this is just amazing. Someday maybe I'll be able to do this type of thing. As far as none of the tools were available back then. Um, so I put together this uh, presentation that's going to show the results. And I hope you like it. And what the presentation will be, a, will be about is not how to do time lapse imaging and not very much dwelling on equipment. And to me, the astronomy is the interesting part. And equipment is just a means to an end. So a lot of this is going to be pretty subtle changes that you'll look for. And some of these are in black and white. So really you have to pay close attention. I'll tell you what to look for in the case, but in some cases you'll be leaning into the thing to really see what's happening here. So I said I was going to talk about hardware. Here's just three slides that show the main cameras that got used. Uh, one of the cameras is what a lot of people have, a single lens reflex camera with a complemented lot of lenses ranging from fisheye to a telephoto. This one is set up on Camelback Mountain in Phoenix, uh, working toward four feet. So we show the time lapse from it later. Here's the, uh, the second camera is a planetary camera, which is this little red disc that you see in the focus of my 15 inch telescope, which is set up out my driveway. Now, 
third camera is much more specialized. It's a cooled uh, CCD charge coupled device camera that's uh, in my backyard Golak Observatory uh, on a 12 and a half inch telescope. And that's where you see the more deep animations and deep time lapse of uh, things that are well outside the solar system. So let's get to it. The uh, best way to start is to uh, look at some low observatory sites. Uh, I was fortunate to get hired on part time. So I come off for periods ranging from a few nights to, to two weeks. And I observed for a while as the uh, telescope operator for a 42 inch telescope, which is at Anderson Mesa. So I get oriented here. There's Flagstaff right at the edge of Flagstaff at the west edge of Mars Hill. And if you go on Lake Ferry Road, uh, you'll get to Anderson Mesa. You go a lot farther down in, uh, down Lake Ferry Road, about an hour from Flagstaff, and you get to the flagship telescope, the Lowell Discovery Telescope. That's Lowell's uh, IM 4.3 meter telescope. Um, so let's look at uh, the first of these animations is uh, not today yet. This is a uh, one of my favorite uh, aesthetically beautiful sights in the, in the sky that you see with your naked eye is when Cassiopeia, this W, and the Big Dipper are uh, situated opposite of Polaris, which is uh, framed this way. Polaris in this animation and this time lapse is, just, is the pole star where the pole, the axis of the Earth points. So it's barely going to move. It's just going to sit there and these are going to rotate counterclockwise. And so we're seeing a little bit of clouds. What we're watching the 42 inch telescope do is follow an asteroid. So it's just pointing, tracking the sky, and then they don't shut its close. Let's run that one one more time. And you'll see Polaris is sitting here, and the rotation in the background is the 72 inch Perkins telescope. This is a, a rare night where it wasn't open from dusk to dawn, as you can see these for a couple hundred nights per year, much like uh, 42 inches, nearly that level. <clears throat> cool thing about doing time lapse is the bonus of not only you can get a video, but you can uh, blend all the frames together and produce a star trails image. And so you're seeing every 20 minutes or so the dome, which is moving along to, so that the slip can be aligned with the telescope to pop over the night sky as it rotates. Another one looking at the 42 inch Hall telescope. This case we're looking in the Northeast and this is taken in June. As you get toward dawn, we start seeing the winter sky rise like that's what we're seeing in this case. So again, you'll see what's happening. And I have this beautiful catwalk at the 42 inch, but you'll see the advancing dome as, it, as the telescope is following up. It's toward the end of the uh, time lapse the telescope has moved away from an asteroid that is following and moved to multiple targets that were defined by, uh, by Brian Skiff, who's been kind of my mentor. About it. <clears throat> if we go inside of the dome, we'll see the 42 inch upper cage of the telescope following uh, the object. And you also will see uh, Scorpius, which is this constellation that's kind of a moving target as the dome uncovers it. And from the inside, you get this uh, completely different view of it that shows the motion as we look uh, toward the southeast. The uh, telescope I mentioned earlier, that's down the road from Anderson Mesa, where the 42 inch, 72 inch arc is uh, the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And you have a car in here for scale, and this is a 4.3 meter uh, mirror, so 14 feet, whatever that is. And this is my drone photo looking into the, into the slit of the observatory. And now we'll look at a time lapse of it going through the motions. In this case, looking toward the east, we have a little glow of the zodiacal light, and the dawn is going to come up here eventually. It'll observe well in the twilight until you're only about half hour to 45 minutes before, um, before sunrise. So this telescope, uh, like any telescope in the world we, we would hope should be is operating on every clear night from dusk from dusk to dawn. So the shift for a telescope operator is to get out to this telescope at four in the afternoon in the winter and be there until six or seven in the morning. And 
<clears throat> so wonderful telescope that does a lot of observing for its size, especially of uh, solar system objects. And that's not necessarily the case for other large observatory telescopes. So now if we go inside the observatory with a fisheye lens, we get this. This was uh, taken during a nearly full moon. So these telescopes at the observatories operate irrespective of the phase of the moon. And it'll limit you in some ways. What's not ever, there's a lot of math goes into this, but what's not obvious to me is uh, how do you move the dome with this type of telescope to keep up with objects? And sometimes it seems like it's moving even in the wrong direction, but as you can see, it's always perfectly aligned. The slip of the dome is aligned. But, so if I uh, now take all of these images and put them into a single image, I get something that looks sort of weird like this, but you get a lot of the motion of the telescope is now just a blur. And you see the constellation Orion and Sirius, the closest stars, and then the weather stars at the close end and the pellet. You also get a nice uh, strip through these panels that shows the mountains that are off in the distance looking off to the south coast. Um, Tom, I'm gonna just jump in here and I think we're getting a little bit of um, uh, sound maybe from your keyboard or desk or something. I'm not sure exactly, but there's some a little bit of extra sound. So I don't know if, if okay. that's something that can be changed. But in any way, I just wanted to let you know. All right, thanks. I'll do what I can. <clears throat> So I showed a couple of the large telescopes at the observatory. Um, we have 4.3 meter little discovery telescope and then a 42 and 72 inch at Anderson Mesa. Uh, one thing that, that's coming to Anderson Mesa is we'll have a, a one meter class telescope added to the, what's already there. So we wanted to evaluate locally which site of two sites that are a quarter mile away from each other has the most more steady atmosphere. And so we put one of these consumer grades, Celestron 14, on an equatorial mount that follows the sky. It kind of gives a good illustration of how an equatorial mount and telescope works to follow the sky. And we put that at one place and another similar, or almost the same configuration at another place. And with some magic, uh, you can actually measure how steady the atmosphere is at the two sites and got a real favorable result out of it. Yeah. A lot of what we didn't really know before, uh, especially about how good this site actually is as a observing site um, outside of the dome. So that's the low observatory time lapses that I wanted to show. Now let's look at some rising and setting objects. It's sort of rising and setting. The dotted line that will run through again in the animation that starts there and ends there is the International Space Station. I think a lot of people know this already, but you can go to a site called Heavens Above and enter your location, and it'll tell you when the space station is going to come overhead. And so every couple weeks or so, every week and a half, you'll get a period of a few days in the morning or in the evening, after sunset or before sunrise, where you'll get a favorable pass. And it can be anywhere and in the middle of the biggest city, and you'll see it because it's, it's very bright, bright as Jupiter itself. So just combining those images into one frame, you get this. And with an app that you can run an uh, app for a phone, you can run a phone, it gives you where is the space station situated over your location, relative to your location. So at the beginning of this art, it's over Joshua Tree National Park to the west of me, and at the east end of it is over Pie Town. So it has covered uh, quite a distance there. That's covered 500 miles in less than two minutes. So works out to over 15,000 miles per hour. Well, it is not an airplane passing over. Uh, first in a series of moonrise photos, this is a, a full moon that's rising over four peaks. It's a little bit jerkier than I wanted it to be. Um, but what you can always see with the full moon is it's always obviously opposite the sun, receiving 100% illumination. But you also get to see the changing aspect of twilight. That's the moon rising that you can use. So if we zoom in a little bit closer, let's watch the moon rise between two of the four peaks. For scale, that's a ponderosa pine tree. 
right in the middle of the frame. That's the pulse of fibrils and pine trees, the metropolitan phoenix, I would guess. These are the four peaks, all right, at the about 40 miles to the east of Count Calcaic. So in this case, I wanted to follow the moon going behind the sort of iconic uh, towers that are the radio towers that are on South Mountain at the south edge of town. In this case, I just stayed on the moon and let the scenery go by. And I kind of like these animations when you, when you just lock on the target and let the terrestrial part of the scene go by because you, you get the feeling that you really are, you're kind of falling backward rather than the moon rising, it's the new moon and that moon sitting there. Uh, I have one of a crescent moon setting that we'll see here. And a couple things to look for before I run the animation are the earth shine will start to appear, which is the inside of that crescent. At the beginning here, you don't see it. And the inside of that crescent, that is not illuminated by the sun. Rather, that's illuminated by the light of the earth. It's reflected light of the earth. And the earth's phase, if you were on the moon looking at the earth, would be the opposite of this crescent. So it would be a very large, almost full of, of gibbous earth. So that's something to look for. Another thing to look for is that as it sets, um, there, is a, there is a flame that's going to go by and it's almost going to run into the moon, but then amazingly it swerves to avoid it. There you go. See that. Okay, so these shots don't just happen. There's, there, there's some homework that goes into it. There's an app for a phone called Photo Pills that allows you to align both the scenery that you like with, with astronomical objects that are going to rise or set behind it. And in this case, we're looking at Camelback Mountain. I'm seeing the hump to the camel and the head. And if you're in Scottsdale or Paradise Valley, you see a feature called the Frame Mount. And that is this feature. I thought it would be cool to have the moon set behind the frame moat and see what that time lapse looks like. So this will take a little bit to run, and there it is going behind the moat. And I was pleased that it actually lined up uh, just right after one practice session out there. But the time lapse is all right, but what I really was happy with was just the kind of painting aspect that you have of the first quarter moon as it goes behind the frame. And so you never know how these things are really gonna work out and, and you put everything together. And for every one of these successes, there's there are at least two failures. Um, not only does the moon go through phases, but the planets that are inside of the Earth's orbit, Art, Mercury, and Venus also go through phases. And I love doing this with just a telephone lens or a short focal like telescope have scenery in the foreground and then have the crescent Venus. So in this case, I've already shown one, one uh, time lapse of the moon rising behind the towers at South Mountain. So these are the same towers viewed from a distance of 12 miles uh, to the east, mostly east, southeast. And now we're gonna watch uh, the crescent Venus set behind these towers, the radio tower. This one from the start, I thought, yeah, the time lapse will be okay, but the, the better version of it is just to do the still frame that has the crescents at the, the towers that are so familiar to anybody who lives in Phoenix or campus. I went out with uh, my friend uh, Dean Pedelson and my wife Jennifer, and, and he decided it would be a cool idea to go and do the same thing, but behind Kit Peak. And on the left, the kind of strange shaped observatory is a solar telescope uh, that has since been decommissioned. And then on the right, the largest film is, the, is a four meter uh, telescope at, at 50, which is still <clears throat> barely the, the largest telescope on the mountain. So here's the Crescent Venus, and we'll watch it zoomed in, setting behind the four meter film. And this took a lot of planning and some luck to actually have it work out right. What was kind of cool is Jennifer was about 50 feet to the north of us, and that translates to 50 feet on the mountain where we are. And so rather than just barely having Venus appear in that last little bit, uh, she said, oh, there's Venus, and we're not seeing anything that help came out. So really depends on your location to, to get these things to work out. 
Um, this is a little different, not, not the solar system. We're looking at the, uh, part of the Milky Way called the sputum star cloud. And again, I'm gonna lock on the, stop, or the stars and let the horizon move up. And we're gonna see one of the many uh, effects of the atmosphere on astronomical observing. So first we'll just watch this happen and just ignore the planes. These are, this is a site that's uh, between LAX and Phoenix and we get a lot of air traffic from Los Angeles, especially right after sunset. <clears throat> but when we zoom in on this, I'll just take a look at what happens when we zoom in. And you might start to see that the stars are kind of getting squished as, uh, as the mountain rays moves to engulf them. And I'll make that clearer in this version by circling a few of the stars and you'll see them getting pushed up. So that is called refraction, and that's a bending of starlight as it enters a new medium. Uh, it's not just going through outer space anymore. And as you get looking through more and more atmosphere, what you're doing as you look lower and lower, that refraction effect gets to be stronger and stronger. Um, and it's not just limited to the horizon. So even looking, it's surprising to be even halfway up to the zenith or more, there's, there's always some degree of refraction lifting all of your, uh, your astronomical objects. And it is one of the many reasons, probably one of the more minor reasons, why we like to put telescopes out in space. But, you know, we got to breathe. So, yeah, very good. Uh, here's refraction. It's actually called dispersion. And when we look at refraction, the, the red wavelengths are not refracted as much as the blue end of the spectrum. Uh, blue, unfortunately, gets absorbed so much that we don't get a blue flash, but we do get a green flash. This is the one slide that's, that's not from Arizona. This is taken over Lake Michigan from my hometown, West Michigan. And here's what the green flash is. So anybody hearing green flash and expecting the whole sky to light up with a flash, who's disappointed because this is what it really is. So you're just getting the last little bit of the refracted image of the sun that's only the green wavelengths are getting through. If it's really, really transparent, I've seen great images of the blue flash that actually comes through, but in this case, it's not transparent. We were, uh, 2020 was, was not, is not going to go down as everybody's favorite here for the obvious reason, but we had Three great astronomical phenomena. One was the fading, unprecedented fading of Betelgeuse, one of the brighter stars in the sky, a uh, variable star. At the later end of the year, we had a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. The best uh, thing that happened was uh, this comet, Neowise, which became naked eye bright and just a gorgeous sight. So here's Jennifer and me having a look at it. Uh, you can see an ion tail and a, and a dust tail. The two components, and those were visible in binoculars and the telescope. So, the first one I wanted to show you is one of these things that I always wanted to get, which was just a black and white image of the tail rising before the head of the comet. So, here we'll watch an animation of the comet rising with clouds passing in the foreground. That's going to help to see it again. Go back to that. There we go. So we're going to watch uh, Comet Neowise from just east of Phoenix, over you know, the Superstition Mountains, and some clouds moving along. And man, I hope everybody got a chance to get out and see this comet because they only come around, you know, every 10, 20 years that you have a comet that's just bright and spectacular. So it's all the structure. Now, a lot of the slides in the presentation, I'm trying to demonstrate something with the atmosphere or astronomically. But this one I just wanted because I think the clouds look cool. You know, this was under a, a pretty big moon, like the first quarter moon of illuminating the scene. And by this point, the comet was getting near the end of its show. Uh, July, typically in Arizona, is an extremely cloudy month with the storm. The 2020 monsoon was extremely dry. And so we had a lot of nights that were going out of the moon comet to realize. <clears throat> The next part of the presentation is uh, going to be these three classes of uh, things passing in front of other things. I'll just describe them briefly. Occultations. An occultation is when a large object, large body passes in front of a smaller body. 
eclipse obviously is just a shadow being cast on a body transit. The opposite of an occultation is a small body passing in front of a large body. And I'll have examples of all three of these here. This one barely sped up. It's Venus going behind the moon. And I'll never have another chance at this because it's rare to have both of these up in a dark sky for the entire event. And so it's wonderful to have this happen in a dark sky and have a clear night and almost everything go right with the equipment. But the main thing to notice here is that the moon, despite it being so much closer to us, is so much fainter. It's underexposed, whereas Venus is pretty grossly overexposed. So Venus reflects about three quarters of the sunlight that falls on it. And the moon, is, so we're looking at an atmosphere in Venus' case, and the moon, we're looking at a surface that's kind of like the basalt around the, uh, the volcanic basalt around Flagstaff that re it only reflects about an eighth of the sunlight. So a real big difference, and despite the moon being so close, we have a big disparity in the brightness. Um, while that was going on, I had a, a much wider field telescope set up in the front yard, and that was reporting a smaller version of what you saw was the egress, where the planet comes out from behind the moon. And I really wanted to get that uh, in the larger focal light telescope, but I pointed here and it happened here. So can't win all of them. Mentioned eclipses. Well, obviously eclipses that, are, that we know about very well are lunar and solar eclipses. Lunar eclipses will come your way every, at least every couple of years, every year or two, you'll have a partial or, or total eclipse that can go out over your location and see after skies. Very rare for, for the middle of the eclipse to happen right at midnight. And that's what happened on this perfect April night where all the conditions were perfect. And I don't want to be anywhere but, but Southern Arizona for, for something like this. Beautiful with that. Let's watch the shadow of the Earth go across the moon a couple of times. And you can see when it gets completely engulfed, it's orange. So if you're standing on the moon, looking back at the, the Earth and seeing a totally eclipsed sun, it wouldn't turn black. It actually, you would have this ring of uh, refracted sunlight. The same thing we see with the orange twilights that we get. So in this case, that's the light that's going through the Earth's atmosphere and landing on the moon, even during the middle of the eclipse. And there are a thousand ways to prevent, to, sorry, to present a lunar eclipse. And there's only one right way in my opinion, and it's that. So that was done way back in the 70s by Akita Fuji, of Japan, one of the greatest astrophotographers for this type of work. And he did it nearly perfectly. And this is my imitation of that. What I love about it is that it shows the, the Earth's shadow, the size of the shadow. So of course the Earth is about three, little more than three times the size of the moon, the diameter of the moon, and there's its shadow kind of bracketing the actual the eclipse moon. So we have uh, different types of eclipses of the sun, the two main uh, types of eclipses of total eclipse and uh, annular eclipse. And since the moon is not in a circular orbit, it's an oval elliptical orbit, sometimes it, the moon completely covers the sun. Those are the ones that you travel thousands of miles to go see. And still worth traveling to go see an annular eclipse, which is when the moon is farther away and you get an annulus, so a ring of light. So you don't get to see the corona and the prominences, but you do get to see something that looks like that. And so this was done on, a, on an interval, intervalometer, a timer remote. So while I was busy some, doing something else, I was very happy when that frame happened, when that middle frame came to be. And so that's kind of the, the usual way of presenting uh, the annular control very quick. Everybody waits for first contact when the first light out of the sun happens. Uh, this image was taken to the telescope that had a filter that allows the very na uh, narrow range of the spectrum. It's called hydrogen alpha, the wavelength that just allows that narrow uh, wavelength to pass and you get to see problems. Features 
I remember this one. So it's like first contact followed by third contact. And there is the kind of the end of the eclipse as it moves on to become a partial eclipse. I thought this was cool that the prominence is or is it the, the, the need for eclipse. And now we move on to transits. So I've seen uh, occultations and eclipses. This is a transit of Venus. And we had a pair of them eight years apart. That's how it works. Uh, 2004 and 2012. This is the 2012 transit. And the next ones that will occur are uh, they, that pair begins in the year 2117. So, you know, watch your diet. And, you know, take care of yourself. And maybe you'll be around in 95 years to, to watch the next pair of transits. So here it is passing uh, behind a saguaro cactus. And it happened in June when the swarrows are in bloom. So they had that extra bit on the top of each of the arms. You also have a couple of sunspots that are not the transit. Those are actual features on the white light disk of the sun. And after that, what's nice again about time lapse art is not only combining all the frames to make star trails or whatever, but within all those frames, if by chance one of them is going to be the right one that makes the best picture, which I thought was valid. Mercury transits the sun more commonly. I've seen five Mercury transits in my years in the hobby. Mercury is tiny in this image. It's at the low center. You can see it's the only dot. There are no significant sunspots. One more time here. And we'll watch it come up behind uh, some swarm cacti that are in the background. It's not an autofocus image. It's just that's what the atmosphere does in the early morning. It's very turbulent. It can see the disc moving around. I thought that was the best of the, of the images. But Mercury is only about the size of the moon and twice as far away as Venus when it transit. So it's just a little dot on the sun. But if you put enough magnification on it and you put a telescope with a long focal length, you can get something that, that's pretty cool. It looks like this. So here's the disk of Mercury with a telescope with that same filter that I mentioned earlier, the hydrogen alpha filter. With that, you can see the actual layer that's called the chromosphere. So a photosphere is the overwhelmingly bright layer that we see when we look at the sun. The filter allows you to see a layer that's only a couple thousand miles thick that's outside of it. And that's where all this great activity happens. So you'll see these features that are like many prominences are called speculoes. And you'll watch these uh, coming off of the disk. And as far as degree of difficulty of I've shown so far, this was right up there. Um, and really have to get how this all came off. It's just a beautiful thing to watch visually through the telescope as well as on the computer screen. So usually when these things are happening, we'll have two or three telescope cameras out there get different aspects of it. Um, back to uh, an eclipse and a transit. Uh, so far, I've just been doing a lot of uh, mostly sun and moon and inner planets. And this is a shadow. That's the shadow of the innermost moon of Jupiter, Io. And this is over a period of about an hour. Jupiter rotates with a period of only 10 hours. Its day is 10 hours long, so it really could be long. Not only can you see the shadow, I'll have arrows here that highlight where to look. You'll see the, the moon itself. You'll see Io, the kind of an orange color uh, moon, just rotating off the disk in the bottom cloud belt. The southern cloud belt is the great red spot. So for scale, the Earth is about, uh, the diameter of the Earth is about the same as the width of the Great Red Spot. We could string 10 Earths across Jupiter. Now we're getting kind of a little more esoteric, but I feel like I have to show it anyway. This is from the very turbulent conditions in my driveway. Um, the largest moon of Jupiter is uh, Ganymede. And what we're seeing here is Jupiter casting a shadow out in the space, the light is coming from right to left in the photo. And what we're seeing is Jupiter's shadow eclipsing Ganymede. So not only do we get transits and occultations for Jupiter, uh, for the moons of Jupiter, you also get these eclipses. It's pretty cool, it'll, it'll disappear here. And then hours later, 
it'll reappear way off the frame as the four moons again in, in the telescopic view. Um, that, that's kind of a segue into some solar system stuff I want to show you. This sort of fits the description of solar system. They are geosynchronous satellites around the Earth. So geostationary satellites are like uh, direct TV, you know, anything that you want to just park over one location in the Earth. And in order to do that, you put it 26,000 miles over the surface, and its period of revolution will be 24 hours, the same as our period in rotation. And in this one, I decided just to sit on these satellites. And in this case, I don't have to track anything. I just do repeated uh, exposures. And I can't remember the length. They're probably 30 seconds exposures or so. And just follow this for four hours. And what we're going to look for is before they pass into the Earth's shadow, they'll flare up greatly, which is a known effect called the opposition effect. And this one in particular is going to overflow the register on the CCD camera and you can see a big blue, then they'll all disappear and then come back out of the shadow. None of which I was really anticipating when I put this together. Well, I just parked uh, the telescope with the drive and I see the flaring taking place. They go into the shadow and they come back out. That's pretty cool. One of my favorite, oops, I jumped into it too fast, but one of my favorite things to the time lapse was the shadow of Camelback Mountain. It's a terrestrial, but it leads into the next slide, which is very much astronomical. And what you're seeing is the shadow of the mountain. I'm only a few hundred feet up it, and it's very uh, exaggerated with the scale. Finally, that shadow is going to work its way up four peaks until you see it become the Earth's shadow. And the Earth's shadow moves up and then out of the frame. I thought it'd be cool to, to then point at the moon for several hours for a period of time and see if you could see the shadow of craters and mountain ranges and rims of uh, craters always going across. And so that's what we'll look at here. It's a little bit subtle, but uh, there's Alpanius, the crater, and all these shadows of the mountains. So the light is coming from the right, and this is sunrise. So if you're sitting in that crater floor, now you see the sun pop up. But you also see kind of the exaggerated profile. And I think this might have contributed in the 50s or 40s before we really knew what the moon looked like up close to a lot of these science fiction renditions of, of mountains on the moon kind of looking like the Grand Tetons, where in fact they're, they all have very shallow slopes. And so you get this kind of exaggerated scale in this case. This qualifies as a time lapse, even though it has only two frames. There'll be a little more of these coming up. Uh, the straight wall is one of our favorite features to look at, and we're just looking two weeks apart at sunrise and sunset lighting. And you convince yourself when you look at it that it's a cliff, but actually it's less than a thousand feet high and it's a seven percent grade. And we've all driven up seven percent grades in our cars, so it just had an exaggerated lighting effect again. You know, we're seeing sunrise and sunset. Okay, onto the sun. So you're just a kind of boring time lapse just to show a full disk view. You'll see that the sun rotates, has a period of I guess it's right, 25 days. So all this stuff is a moving target going across. I showed prominences, these features that are dark, there are also prominences, but we call them filaments and they are in silhouette against the sun. Well, here's the first of these large, sort of giant prominences coming off of the sun. This was not taken during an eclipse. I, I decided to mask off the sunlight off to the right side, which is just attracting. So on the side of the Earth, you can kind of see, wow, these things are huge, and they're moving at tens to even hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. Just a couple of years ago, not even that, a year and a half ago, my favorite of the prominences are these uh, thrones, these streamers that are, that are coming back to the surface. So these kind of get entrained in the magnetic field and you get this almost stationary feature that they go this high and then fall back into the surface. These are a lot of loop uh, prominences. This is not my animation. This is from, from a website that shows uh, six different solar images in hydrogen alpha from around the planet so we can always monitor it. I decided to go out on this day an image 
that filament and see if it showed any activity. My first frame when I was not, and I wasn't really babysitting the camera the whole time because this was all kind of happening for an hour and a half in the background. My first frame showed that. And then when I got back out there, I wondered what's wrong? You know, what happened here? And what happened was this. <clears throat> so here we have a, a coronal mass ejection. And you can see kind of how this whole thing blows up and that's the end of that problem. So none of these prominences last forever. They last, sometimes they go the entire half of a rotation, but they rarely come back around you know, after a month. Again, the earth is shown here for scale. I like this illustration and I lead into a watching Venus go through its phases. There's a lighting on Venus when it's a crescent and it's about six times larger there than when it's behind the sun. I thought I would follow it for some months to get it to go through its phases from about there to there. We end up with something that looks like this. This is six months of looking at Venus. We see it's uh, increasing angular size as it gets closer to us. It's phase going to a very thin crescent and then back to uh, give us phase as it's farther away. So the joys of having a backyard observatory is I can go out, you know, each day now that I'm retired and do this stuff for half hour and then have a normal day after that. Going with the 15 inch telescope and a filter that, that allows you to isolate the light of the atmosphere a little better. Here's uh, five images that show the growing, six images that show the growing size and changing phase of Venus. We're getting a little bit of the cloud there. We're just looking at the atmosphere in the face of Venus. Mars goes through phases as well, but only from Gibbous to full. So I can't, since it's not inside of our orbit, we don't get a crescent that way. And just to show you that Mars also rotates, it has a day that's about 25 hours long. So almost two weeks apart, I'm excited to just go and uh, image both hemispheres after decent uh, atmospheric conditions. A uh, real challenge here, uh, Phobos and Deimos are these tiny moons of Mars. And in order to get them, I had to grossly overexpose Mars because they're hundreds of thousands of times fainter than Mars. They're just little rocks, they're almost like asteroids out there. And, and then after I would take each of these frames that I reduced the exposure. So you are seeing Mars actually as this was happening, if not substituted from some different night. And it was cool. I've only seen these a couple of times through the telescope. They're extremely hard to see because of the glare of Mars. So there's a view of their orbits. Going farther out in the solar system to Uranus. Here's Uranus and its two brightest moons, Titania and Oberon. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit. <laughs> I see I'm already at the 40 minute mark. Um, and here, since this is I heard Pluto, there's three images of Pluto wandering back and forth. So Amanda mentioned that I've been into astronomy for one and a half orbits of uh, Saturn. Well, I've been into astronomy for one sixth of an orbit of Pluto. So I'm not going to get to see it all the way around the sun. Comets are the greatest thing. And a lot of people think that the tail uh, is going the opposite the direction of motion. In fact, the tail is just getting pushed back by the sun, which would be over in that direction. This had another feature called an orbital debris stream. This is what causes meteor showers when we pass from one of them. We did pass through this one, by the way, that's very common for this topic. Here I'm going to show an asteroid going through a retrograde loop. So a retrograde is just the motion when we pass a car in the freeway, it appears to go backwards while we're passing it. Well, when anything's outside of our orbit in the solar system, it appears to go backwards and then it re resumes its uh, forward motion. And so here we're seeing it on a period of uh, 12 nights uh, in February. So it actually, all of the planets go through these that are outside of our orbit goes to these retrograde loops, which uh, had to have confused the ancients and, and you know, I'll understand it fully. <coughs> Uh, finally, I think this is the last of the solar system ones, so not really solar system. Two days after they launched uh, the James Webb 
space telescope. It also exhibited retrograde motion. This is a cloudy night, which is why these are not continuous. And the retrograde was due to the Earth's rotation. That's not moving to the right, it's actually slowly moving off to the left, but our rotation caused retrograde motion. What's also happening, and this is much more recent after it's out near its parked orbit, is that its brightness is changing greatly. So at 16th magnitude, which means we have to have a large telescope at a dark site to see it, but it flares up by two or three magnitudes by a factor of 10, at least as the uh, sun shield, which faces us as we get specular reflections off of it. And now I have to ask you if you're still awake. Here's 10 hours of paint drying. You can get all, a whole series of 10 hours of grass growing. And um, there actually is a feature on YouTube where you can speed things up by a factor of two so that it's only five hours of paint drying. But maybe a time lapse would be a better idea in this case. All right, so beyond the solar system, the last part of my talk, uh, every star is in motion. We call it proper motion. There's radial velocity toward us or away from us. And then the transverse velocity, we just call it proper motion. And the classic Burnham Celestial Handbook, written by Robert Burnham, a former Lowell Observatory employee, while he was at Lowell, uh, the greatest handout book in the history of amateur astronomy, showed this, this figure. And I first looked at it, you'll see a tick mark that I added in about 1983. And now it's up here somewhere. And I'm going to show you an animation that just has, I think, five images. There's that V asterism that was in there. And here's Barnard Star. So each year I try to remember about April or May to go out, to take another image of Barnard Star and watch it march across the sky. <clears throat> so not only does it happen with these really nearby stars, but farther away objects like the star cluster, the Pleiades, I'm showing here. I'll animate an image, not my image, Paul Lynn did this in 2017. It shows all this nebulosity around the bright stars. But you wonder which of the stars in the field are members. The ones that are members are going to all be going in the same direction. So look in any of these little white rectangles and you'll see them shifting back and forth. The original frame is from way back in the 19th century, like observatory, and I'm combining this with Paul's image. The yellow rectangles are just showing rogue uh, stars that have nothing to do with the Pleiades that have some different direction of proper motion. And of course, the main bright stars are moving along into overexposed to see their motion. That's proper motion. Here is a variable nebula, a jump there, so discovered way back in 1917. It's called Hubble's Variable Nebula. <clears throat> Most things seem kind of static. This one, there are swirling clouds around the illuminating star, the reflection nebula, and so they cast shadows on the wall of this nebula. And what I did here for about six months was, was to go out and image it whenever I could and watch some of these motions in the variable nebula. And what I learned is that it changes only with a scale of a couple of days, two or three days, you're getting subtle changes. And if you had a higher resolution, you'd see it in a day or so, or less. So that's how the variable nebula. Here's a supernova remnant. Uh, 1054 AD, there was a bright supernova in uh, Taurus, and we now call it the Crab Nebula. And I'm going to start way back in 1909 and then have a frame from 1950s and the 1990s. And then the last one will be mine, which was taken about a week ago. And this is the Crab Nebula expanding. So pretty cool that we have this nebula that, that we can watch this happen. And that is the result of a supernova where the star completely blows up and you just have this remaining uh, feature going off into space. Another supernova on that famous uh, favorite of amateur astronomers is called the Veil Nebula. These are the two sides of it and here is it moving very uh, subtly back and forth, left and right. In these frames that are from Palomar Observatory in 1953 and then from my backyard. This one's also doing that. In the next one, I'm going to zoom in on that. I'm going to register on the nebula, not on a background star, to see if we can see changes within it. And now the stars are going to move back and forth. I kind of get this sense that the, the nebula is kind of twisting, like you see that moving to the left and that while that that moves to the right, like it's rotating uh, out of the plane of the screen. 
Uh, that's kind of cool. 1916, so I'm a century between the frames. Now, the last few, if you don't have enough mass in your star to make a supernova, it's on one of them, it'll make a planetary nebula. And then one of the most nearby bright planetaries is the Helix Nebula in Aquarius. And here we're watching it expand. And we're also watching all the stars slide by in the background as we've registered on the nebula, which is much closer than the background stars. The Dumbbell Nebula is another uh, amateur favorite. Well, here we go again back to Lake Observatory, 1899, and we can see the expansion. So these things, again, look like they're holding their form, but when you calculate the velocity, the, rate, the transverse velocity, and you know the distance, and you just do some trigonometry, you get a result that's always in the tens of thousands of miles per hour to hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. Nothing is holding its form. It's just so far away and large that it takes that long to see these pictures. In this case, we're looking at a globular cluster, They're kind of moving farther and farther out into the, into the galaxy. Looking at a, at a globular cluster which has variable stars in it. These are called RR Lyrae stars. And you're probably not going to see any of them vary until I do this. And now you can see in just a period of three hours, we have all these blinking lights, and these are just six of them. There's actually dozens of frames that are all variable stars in this globular cluster, and these vary by a great amount in a real short period. So, an amateur favorite for kind of beginning projects and recorded projects. To keep moving out farther, this is the second to last slide, I believe. Uh, I, when I first had first light of my backyard observatory in 2015, I Image the Siamese twin galaxy, and and then in 2020 we we're fortunate enough to have a supernova, so the supernova remnant become nearly as bright as the galaxy as they always do, and so we have this blinking between we have the supernova present and not. Finally, anybody who's done this hobby has been asked like, what's the farthest thing you've seen in a telescope? It used to be one and a half billion light years until this ridiculously bright blazar, uh, CPA 102, um, and visible in 2016. And you could actually see this in like a four or six inch telescope at a dark site. And then here it is varying in brightness. And in each one of these frames, I and many other people measured the, the brightness. And then this actually got published in Nature. So it's very cool as a, as a full author. So well, that is uh, working our way through the many different time lapse projects that I've enjoyed doing. And I can't just end on that slide. I have to end with uh, this slide. So here's my 60 year time lapse of my life. So, and uh, it looks like I went 50 minutes, so I'm proud of myself. I usually can't keep it under an hour. And I hope everybody stayed awake. And thanks a lot for listening. Did I unshare yep, my screen? Um, yeah, yes, why don't we do that? Yep. Okay. I need one quick look at that. There's my P-Base site where there's a lot more time lapses. And anybody wants to friend me on Facebook, as long as you don't post about politics, I'll be happy to be your friend. All right. <laughs> so there we all are again. Amazing, really just beautiful images. Thank you so much. Definitely revealing some worlds and some um, far reaches of our galaxy as well. So that was just a beautiful presentation, Tom. Thank you. So we're opening up for um, questions from, um, from our audience right now. So if anybody has any questions for Tom, feel free to type them in. I'm gonna start off and just ask you how you how you got um, interested in astronomy or photography, astrophotography in, you know, in the beginning. Yeah, you know, I, I just always forget to give credit to my parents, my, my mother in particular was encouraging anything that we wanted to do that was disruptive like this, that was legitimate. And, and she would take this out every August 10th, the night of my birthday, the wrong night, it should have been the 11th, to go watch the Tears of St. Lawrence, which was the, which we now know as the Perseid meteor shower. And and we'd all try to outdo each other. I saw one, and we did, you know, my brothers and sisters, and see who got the highest number. But something I noticed was that I just had a 
what this was my what I was adept at was looking at the sky and seeing things that that other people aren't seeing, and and it struck me then all through my childhood, and then something happened when I was 16 years old. I said, I'm gonna buy a telescope, and at that point, there's just no looking back. There's you know there's no end to what we can do. I hope this presentation showed some of that, um, and that got me going for good. Oh yep. That you uh, you were bitten by the bug and that was the end, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, how have you, um, you know, how did you, um, ex uh, basically kind of uh, create your technique and learn how to do some more of these things? Did you learn from other people? Did you take some classes? Did you figure it out on your own? It's kind of figured out on my own. You know, there's there's places, uh, there's forums for for amateur astronomers and photographers. But what you had to do in the past, like in the days of 35 millimeter cameras and film, we didn't have an intervalometer. You just sat there with a the cable release and a, and a stopwatch or whatever, and, and you had to do it yourself. So I don't have much in that time. But as soon as we got into the realm of digital cameras and SLR cameras and primary remotes, then it, that became kind of self-explanatory. And you know, I'm a retired engineer and data analysis nerd. So so I enjoy uh, writing the spreadsheet, putting a spreadsheet together that says, you know, here's the interval that you want to shoot for this particular sequence. Because that is important. You don't want to overdo it every second or, or, or uh, under sample. And so anytime I do these, I kind of have some planning that goes into it that, that I really enjoy doing. And so all that kind of self talk. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So if we've got um, some audience members tonight who are thinking that they might be interested in, you know, learning how to do this themselves, what would be your advice to them about how to, how to get started in astrophotography? Yeah, probably the best thing to do are, and I showed a lot of these, especially like the mobile seat, there's a camera and tripod with a wide angle lens. So even like a 50 millimeter lens and a standard lens is too much both length most of the time unless you're doing moon rising and it just makes things harder. So the easiest thing to do for aesthetically pleasing stuff is like a 24 millimeter, 28 millimeter lens and a, and a camera. Um, today's cameras are just amazing for how low the noise is at high ISO. So you can go to ISO 16,000 or whatever and do 15, 20 second exposures and get a timer remote. Um, in the case of Canon, the camera that I have, you're happy to sell one for $120, but you can get one of these Chinese knockoffs for $25 that does exactly the same thing. Um, so it's not too expensive. And that's the, thing, that's the place to start. And, and don't jump into trying to do this through telescopes because that, that's where it starts getting challenging. Yeah, so by doing this with a um, camera on a tripod, that's when you're getting some of those star trail images that you were yeah. showing us, right? Yeah, yeah right. star trails, uh, there's, there's a free software called star trails that, that will blend all your frames. I like to do it in Photoshop. So if you're in Photoshop, you just take it, you read all these in as layers, and then you blend all those layers in the lighting mode, and there's star trails. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I use something called Star Stacks, but I think there's probably lots of different types of things for that. Yeah. Do you have a, um, a favorite target that you like to um, observe or photograph? Um, no, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> and as you saw from the presentation, I'm open to anything that, that changes. Um, I'm not, I would say my, my uh, weaker stuff is, is the camera and tripod things. So. Not everybody's interested in doing planetary images with, with the, the webcam. A lot of people are happy just to make static photos. I want to see things move. So, so that kind of sets me apart that I like looking at these transits or watching rotation of Jupiter or Mars, that sort of thing. So you could say that's maybe my favorite in that I do the most of it is, is with, the, with the webcam and you know, the planetary telescope. I think of, you know, since we're living up here in Flagstaff, I think of the Phoenix area as being very, very bright at night. And yet you've, you know, you've um, gotten some really beautiful images there. So um, I guess it depends um, what you're doing. Um, people can be impacted differently by the, um, by so the night sky brightness. 
the way to think of that is uh, I can't see, well, with, our, with a lot of concentration, I can see the Milky Way and Cygnus right overhead from my backyard observatory. And so I'm losing three magnitudes about a factor of 10 in, 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 due to the sky brightness. And that's not going to get much worse over the years. So if I just take that three magnitudes and subtract that from how faint I could go, if I was at a dark site with my telescope and CCD camera, I can still get the 18th or 19th magnitude. And there's you know, limitless possibilities of what you can do if you can even only go that faint instead of way out, like I put at a dark site. But yes. try to let that discourage me too much. Sounds like then your sight is not that bright if you can see the Milky Way overhead naked eye. Yeah, I'm barely. a yeah. visual observer. <laughs> Pull yeah. out all the stops and barely see the Milky Way. I That's see. Really okay. Um, we've um, we're we're, get, we're we're hitting time here, but we've got one question that we'll um, we'll go through here from Stephen. It says he says, do you see impacts on either your long exposures or image stacks from the growing number of satellites, the Earth orbiting satellites? And if so, how do you work with those? I'm seeing more satellite image. Uh, so one of my side things, probably the main side thing is doing photometry measuring brightness. And it's been mostly asteroids. And I'm seeing more satellite trails going through these frames. And the field of view is only three quarters of a degree by a half a degree. Um, Stephen, it's a leading question. You, you don't want to get me started about Starlink. So, um, <laughs> you know, said there, he's going, hey, and, and amazingly in the hobby, well, go ahead and get me started. In the hobby, there are a lot of amateur astronomers who think Starlink is great because they're gonna get internet out at their site and they're just doing pretty pictures in which they stack images and they can get rid of the satellite trails. But there's a lot more to astronomy than pretty pictures and, and the satellites are going to have a big impact on, on that in the future. And it's not just Starlink, but tens of thousands of others that we have to look forward to. So it's not happening too much yet because we're still only at a couple of thousand or even that much, but it's going to explode in the next five years or so. Just polluting the water like we always do. I'm going to worry about it later. <laughs> I know it's a, it's a topic for a lot of discussion. So we will <laughs> not go into that right now because we're a little bit over time. So I'm going to... Um, <laughs> Thank you once again, um, just a beautiful presentation. We really appreciate your sharing your images with us and your experiences with us. It was really quite a treat. So once again, Tom Palakis, thank you very much. All right, thanks.